We began this series by uh, telling you about the Dust Bowl era farmers who in the late 1930s found themselves down to the last bit of seed they had left. There had been years of drought. Um, It was a difficult time, Uh, but many of those farmers um, took what little seed they had left. They sowed it into the soil, and in 1939, the rains came, and the harvest was abundant. And I told you that those people who took what they had, and they, they put it at risk, and they sowed that into their fields, uh, they didn't just feed their families with what they were able to raise. They, they saved their farms, and they secured their future. Uh, but the part of the story that I didn't tell you is that not all of the families during that time uh, chose to sow that little bit of wheat that they had left into their fields, As a matter of fact, some of them, uh, looking at the the difficulty of their situation, some of them were facing such extreme hardship that they took that little bit of wheat seed they had left and they ground it up. They ended up using it to make breads and ultimately to feed their family. And they survived for a little bit longer. The problem came because they didn't sow their fields. They weren't able to bring anything in the next year. But something unique happened. These families who had shared in in times of suffering when there wasn't much, uh, they'd struggled together. Uh, They were neighbors who discussed what the plan was and what they were going to do and how they were going to make it through the difficult times. Those who had chosen to sow in their fields, uh, when the crop grew up and it produced a harvest of 30 or 60 or 100 fold what they had planted, they fed their families, they saved their farms, they secured their future, but they were also able to share with their neighbor And in this series, I've been calling on us as a church to invest our lives into the the kingdom of God, to sow what God has given us into God's kingdom with the hope of reaping a harvest. Uh, But I want you to know that that harvest, what God returns back to us as we seek after him, it isn't just for us, but rather God wants us to use that in order to bless other people who are far beyond us, that much of the abundance that we get to enjoy in our own relationship with Jesus Christ and his provision for us in all of the various ways isn't just for us, but it's actually to be spread to other people. In the first week of this series, we encourage you to begin investing your life into the kingdom of God by devoting daily. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branch. If you will abide in me and you in me, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you will do nothing. So I said the most important investment you will ever make in yourself or anyone else is the investment you make uh, spending time with Jesus Christ in his word and walking with him in prayer throughout your day, devoting yourself every single day to him. And then last week, I called on you to begin to invest by gathering here consistently. You gather with the body of Jesus Christ for corporate worship to celebrate things like baptism together to hear the word preach, and to use our gifts to build one another up. And then as we do so, and we experience the return in our life as God enriches us and grows us spiritually, as we see fruit begin to be born, we share that with one another. This week, one of our awesome deacons, and we do have really, really wonderful deacons, He shared with me an article that he'd read. It's in the Wall Street Journal. A couple of guys, Robert Waldinger and Mark Schultz. Uh, The article is titled, The The Lifelong Power of Close Relationships. Now, the unique thing about this article is its it's longevity. It covers a study done um, by, let's see, it's the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And it started in in Boston in 1938. And so it's an 85-year study where they were seeking to determine what are the things that... uh, make people have a good quality of life? Like, what are the things that are are present in their life that suggest they're going to be healthy, they're going to live a long time, they're ultimately going to be happier and enjoy a higher quality of life? And so they followed, I think it's 733 men and 1,300 of their children for 85 years. And they looked at, I mean, hundreds of, of measurements and various calculations, thousands of questions that they asked all of these individuals, followed them all of this time. And you know, the, the one thing that they came out with, the, the one thing that stood out among all of these families over the, the, the length of this entire study, the one thing that stood out that will improve the quality of life in every single family, the one thing that would determine your emotional health, physical health, the longevity of your life, your satisfaction with your overall circumstances, you know the one thing that would dictate that more than any other thing? The quality 
of your relationships. Some of you might be relieved to know that living longer and having healthier lives and enjoying being more satisfied is not directly tied to the food that you eat. So uh, you're off the hook. You don't have to eat like a granola person, right? You don't have to be a vegan. Uh, If you want to enjoy long and healthy life and and great quality of, of life, you don't have to exercise twice a day, be a CrossFitter or brag about it online. You don't have to do any of those things, but rather if you want to enjoy a long, happy, healthy life, You should make investments into relationships with the people around you. This is the author's uh, notes. He said that personal connections are so significant that if you had to take all of the data gleaned over these 85 years of this study and boil it down to a single principle for living, it would be this. Good relationships make us healthier and happier. To say it more simply, the quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. Now, I think it's a fantastic study. I'm a a science guy. I like long studies with a lot of data because you can rely on those things. You know what I mean? If you're kind of a nerd, you like to have a lot of research that will undergird that. But to be honest with you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've read the Word, you didn't need the Harvard study to tell you that the quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. Because we see all throughout Scripture that relationships can profoundly shape us for the good or for the bad. I'll give you a few examples. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And some, of, some of us have lived long enough to know that that's absolutely true. We've experienced the good and the bad side of that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. In the New Testament alone, there are more than 40 of what are the so-called one another passages that teach us how we should love and pursue and bear with and be patient with one another. How we should treat people uh, whom we are close to, those with whom we enjoy relationships. Uh, The word that we talk about when we talk about how we think you should invest in relationships here, and it's not just our word, it's the biblical word, it's the Greek word koinonia. Now, I tell you that on the front end because when I say fellowship, most everyone in here uh, thinks about a fellowship hall. You think about dishes like the old lady can still cook. You know, they bring all the good food and us young people, we just come and kind of enjoy what they have and add our store-bought cookies to the mix, right? Like we, when I think of fellowship, I think about what happened when I was a kid when we would get together and eat. Uh, but that's not at all the, the meaning of the word that we, we find in, in Greek, But rather, this Greek word koinonia, it teaches us that relationships should be a deep, rich, abiding partnership with other people. Not where we have this interaction that's kind of transactional. What can I get from you? What can you uh, give to me? But rather, where we invest our lives into one another uh, for the good or for the bad. This is the word that, interestingly enough, is used in Acts chapter 2 when the church was first born. Jesus had just died on the cross and then ascended into heaven, and he sent his Holy Spirit uh, out upon his church. And on on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus Christ. And immediately they began to gather in Solomon's colonnade, in the outer course of the temple, if you will, uh, to hear the apostles preach. And then they would gather house to house for the words translated fellowship, for koinonia. And their house to house... They would pray together. They would share meals with one another. When someone got put in prison, they were there to visit each other. When somebody was sick, they took care of one another. These earliest of Christians, without a ton of teaching and without years and years of history about what the church should do, they very naturally began to build these sorts of relationships with one another where they invested their lives together. Such that when persecution broke out in Jerusalem and the believers were scattered all across the the known countryside at the time, they continued to gather in this way. And the church didn't continue to thrive because the apostles were preaching in the temple every week. And the church didn't continue to thrive because of some gigantic gathering with 3,000 people. The church continued to grow and thrive because they had learned what it looked like to live together in this koinonia. And wherever they scattered out, they would gather in these small pockets of believers and they would continue to encourage one another in the Word. They would do life together. They would support one another. 
and invest in each other in those relationships, no matter the circumstances that came. So today, I'm going to be calling on you and inviting you to invest your life into the kingdom of God by investing your life into other believers. This is taking what God has given you. Maybe it's the return that you've seen in your life. Maybe you have a history like me of, of like great mentors and people who have invested in you. They've taught you how to follow after Jesus Christ, and maybe you're kind of brand new to the thing. What we're calling on you to do as the church of Jesus Christ is to begin to invest your life deeply with other believers. Rather than kind of go your own way, do your own thing, you choose to make deep investments into other people and to walk through life with them. Now, the way we describe this as one of our six practices, we call on our church members to commit themselves to community. And I say commit yourself to community because I want you to know on the front end, it's not always going to be easy. Did you know that if you do this, you might have people in your community group who are, and they're kind of difficult at times, you know, um, maybe they'll show up late on a rather consistent basis, or maybe they're kind of argumentative in the midst of discussion, or maybe there's a season they're going to go through a, a really significant depression, and you're going to have to bear with them. But we do so because sometimes we're the one that shows up late, Right? We're the one that doesn't contribute what we should. That sometimes we go through seasons where we're dealing with difficult health issues and struggles in our life, and we need other people to walk with us. The picture that we have in the New Testament isn't merely of a large gathering like this one. It's one where people gather together house to house, home to home, and they invest their lives together, for better or for worse, right? In the good times and in the bad. Today we're going to be looking in Colossians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, and he's kind of given them this picture of, of changing clothes, if you will. Uh, when, when I was a kid, I used to have to mow my parents' lawn, and we had a janky old little slow Murray mower and about two and a half acres that I had to mow. Um, also, we had more than 100 pine trees, and so I would go tell my parents, I'm going to go mow the pine needles, you know, and it was dry and dusty and miserable, and the mower would break down, like Jesus was teaching me patience through that whole process. When I would finish mowing the lawn, I would be absolutely covered. And not like a little dirty. I'm talking like you could scrape your skin and wipe off a thick layer of dust, right? You could see where, where you had cleaned yourself. It would be in my eyes and my ears and all the other places that you don't want dust to be. And I, I would come inside and I would take a long, hot shower. I'm talking water run brown, dirty shower, you know what I mean? And I would step out of the shower and I would finally, it felt so good to be clean after being that filthy. You know what I was never tempted to do when I'd finally been washed clean of all that dirt and was free of it? I was never tempted to put on those filthy clothes that I'd been wearing before. In Colossians chapter 3, that's essentially what the Apostle Paul is telling you and I to do, telling the church at Colossae to do. He's like, here's who you are in Jesus Christ. You've been made clean, like you have been made holy. In, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Put on then as God's chosen holy ones, holy and beloved. He's reminding them that they are chosen of God, that they've been adopted by him. They are loved by God, and they have been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's like, that's who you are. And you've been made holy in him. And yet throughout chapter 3, he's like, and so, man, you got to take off those old ways of living that, in, that you once lived. Man, those old patterns of sin that marked your life. And he's telling them specifically of how they're to relate to one another. And so he's like, man, you got to take off that anger, malice, wrath, slander, lying to each other. you got to take off of those things and instead... You need to look to Jesus Christ. You put on Christ and you relate to others as Jesus Christ has related to you, as he would uh, relate to others if he were living his life out through you. And so here it is in Colossians chapter 3. He's saying, take off the bad things and then put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, 
humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful." Man, you got to take off these old patterns. If you're going to come to enjoy the fullness of who you are in Christ Jesus, if you want to know the riches that are yours as a child of God, the inheritance that we have in Him, if you take off those old patterns, those old ways of relating, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, man, you just peel those off like dirty clothes and instead, and you put on Christ, you put on new ways of living. When he says compassionate hearts here, he's saying a lot. The, the word for heart there in the Greek, it's splugnitsamai. And basically, it gives us the, a picture of the, the, the deepest seat of our desires and affections within ourselves. For the Greeks, it was their bowels. But he's basically saying, um, this is the seat of your emotions. You need to put on a, a heart of compassion, that you should be so compassionate toward other people that you are moved to act on their behalf, that from within, it, you are just compelled to to feel and exercise compassion on behalf of other people. Like this isn't kind of, bless her heart, she's dumber than a rock, uh, uh, whatever, you know, or bless his heart, he can't get his life together. That's not what's talking about here. But this is the sort of compassion that Jesus Christ felt for us when he saw us in our sin. When all we did was rebel against him and walk away and pursue other idols in our lives. And Jesus looked down on us in our sin and wasn't motivated to pour out wrath or anger or malice. But instead, he gave up his life that we might live. He was moved with compassion for us. And the apostle Paul is like, hey, do you want to know how you're supposed to relate to other people? Even when they sin against you, even when they frustrate you deeply, when they keep doing the thing over and over and over, you put on Christ. You clothe yourselves with Christ. You should have compassion on them such that you are moved to act on their behalf, even when it's costly for you. Jesus Christ gave himself up on the cross to suffer and to bleed and die that we might have life. And we put on Christ for each other. We offer ourselves in service to one another. It, he goes on, put on then compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. You know what the Apostle Paul is assuming here? He is assuming that we're going to be close enough in relationships with other people that we're going to have to demonstrate patience. I don't know about y'all, I often get frustrated when I'm, I'm driving, uh, especially long trips. I think at times I, I scare my family uh, because I, I get a little impatient with the people around me. Now, here's what never happens. I don't ever get impatient with the people who are going the opposite direction, right? You got a four-lane divided highway, the traffic on the other side. If it's bumper to bumper or flowing smoothly, I don't really care. It doesn't bother me one bit. I'm far enough away. They don't affect me. It's no big deal whatsoever. The people that frustrate me are those who are close to me, right? It's the guy who's riding my bumper or the one who's going slow in the left lane. It's the person who affects my life. And what the Apostle Paul is assuming in this text is that you're going to live closely enough with other people. You're going to be close enough in a relationship with him that you're going to need to exercise compassion. You're going to need to exercise patience with him. And he even takes it a step further. Bearing with one another. Y'all, you don't bear with people when they're killing it. You celebrate them, right? Man, it's like, gosh, she's doing so great. They built me up. They made me feel great. They're encouraging me in the Word. No, that's not bearing with people. We bear with people when they're falling down, they're stumbling. When they're causing us difficulty and pain. When they're stumbling off the path, we bear with them. And he keeps on going. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. 
what the Apostle Paul assumes when he's coaching the Colossians about their relationship with one another, he assumes on the front end that they're going to live lives closely enough together that they're going to be sinned against and that they're going to have to exercise forgiveness in the same way that Christ has forgiven us. We should be forgiving one another. Now, in our American culture, our tendency is we want to be independent, right? Kind of this rigorous independence, pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I don't need anyone for help. I'm just going to exist out here. I'm going to make my own way and do my own thing. And the Apostle Paul, I believe if he could speak to the American church, he's like, uh-uh, not anymore. And you take off those old ways of living where you think you can do it on your own, where you keep everyone at arm's distance. You, you know, invite them in when they're useful and boot them out when they're not. Apostle Paul's like, no, 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 no. And you put on Christ. And even when people have nothing to offer you, you should be moved with compassion for them. And you exercise patience with them. You bear with them. When they sin against you, and the the number is 70 times 7, right? When they've sinned against you repeatedly, you forgive them. And above all, put on love which binds everything together. To love someone is to sacrificially seek their good. And you want to see them succeed. You want to see them be the best dad they can be, best husband they can be, or wife, or mother, or person, employee, whatever it might be, in any way that we can serve and build one another up. That's what we do when we love them. So, point number one, as we think about community, when we ask you to commit yourself to community, um, the first mark of community for believers is that we would pursue one another relationally. What we see here described as Paul is speaking to the church at Colossae is not general indifference, right? It's not like, hey, you know, good to see you today. We pass each other going the opposite directions and, you know, everything's great and, and then otherwise ignore each other. What we see here in this text are face-to-face relationships that are up close, where sometimes we're close enough that there might even be some friction where we have to exercise patience or forgiveness or bear with one another. What God has called us to as the church of Jesus Christ is to invest in each other relationally, to love one another, bear with one another, forgive one another. As his church, we should be pursuing each other relationally. We want to know one another to be involved in each other's lives. Now, this isn't uh, moving in, by the way. This isn't like, you know, sticking your nose in things that you, you never should have stuck your nose in. This isn't overstaying your welcome at someone's house. But this is finding a group of people, as the early church in Acts did, say, we're going to meet here house to house. We're going to love each other. We're going to lock arms together. We're going to pursue Jesus together. We're going to raise godly families together. We're going to sharpen each other in our marriage, in our walk with Jesus Christ. We're going to challenge each other in the Word. We're going to invest, not just in ourselves, but in one another. So the first mark of community, the core value of community that we call it, is that we would pursue one another relationally. Interestingly enough, uh, the church at Colossae must have been difficult. Y'all, they were pretty different. Uh, Up in, in verse 11, he says, uh, in Christ, he's like, this is not true, obviously, in terms of our, our day-to-day interactions. He says, in Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, uh, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbi- barbarian, city, and slave free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, in their church, there were Jews and Greeks. And just those two distinctions created a lot of friction. The Jews had lived their whole entire lives refusing to ever touch meat that was sacrificed to idols. Or or various ways that they had been distinct in their lives. And there was friction in the church because the Greeks were like, hey, cheap meat, I'm in. Like, feed it to me, right? Like, hey, I like pork. I like all of these things that the Jews had abstained from. There was friction. There were the circumcised and the uncircumcised. There were barbarians who would have not been Jewish sorts of people. Scythians, there were slaves, there were free men. But in the church of Jesus Christ, all of those distinctions melt away. And rather than focusing on the things that might divide us culturally, economically, whatever it might be, we're reminded that we are united in Christ. So we as the church, we pursue one another 
relationally. The second mark of community, the second core value that we have, is that we live authentically with one another. Uh, Have you ever had a relationship with someone uh, that wasn't a two-way street? Y'all know what I'm talking about? This is basically the relationship that I would have with my counselor. Anyone ever been to counseling? It's, it's kind of awesome in some ways, and it's kind of disappointing in others. Um, uh, when you go to a counselor, and you just go in, and you just pour out all your problems, and, and you can. It's a safe place to go, and to, man, I'm just going to let you know all my stuff. And I open myself up. I tell all of the things, and, and the counselor j- just listens, right? And it's really, it's kind of nice. Um, but you know, that's really not a relationship, because it's a one-way street. There's really no depth to the relationship that I have. It's, it's transactional. Um, they listen and I speak. and They hear all of my problems. But I don't ever hear any of theirs. And while they might get to know me really well, I don't get to know them. One of the things that Paul mentions here as we put on Christ and learn how to relate to one another is the word Humility. that we would humble ourselves before one another. And humility isn't merely self-deprecation. Humility isn't stepping back and, and just kind of presenting a, a, a picture of ourselves that's more appealing. Um, humility is presenting ourselves honestly to one another. It's not making more of ourselves than we actually are. Many people think of yeah, humility as, you know, the opposite is pride. And so we think, well, the person who is, man, there's a lot of boastful arrogance there. And that's clearly pride. And that's not humble, right? And so the guy that he's done everything better than you, he knows more than you, he did it faster than you, right? That, that, that braggadociousness, we recognize that. Man, that's pride and it's terrible. But many of us don't recognize pride on the other side of that. It says, I, I don't want people to see my flaws. I don't want to see, let them see me sweat, my weaknesses. And so we just kind of keep a little bit of distance and we never share any of our struggles or, or the weaknesses or our failures or our brokenness because we don't want to be known for who we really are. And so we keep our distance from each other. Humility is not thinking more of yourself than you should or less of yourself than you should. It's presenting yourself as you actually are. Paul's just reminded us that we're all united by one thing, and that is Jesus Christ. We know what our old clothes look like, and they're all dirty. Y'all, every one of us, we took off filthy clothes. We have uh, poor ways of relating. We've lived lives that were sinful, that before God, they were rebellious against Him. They were broken. They were ugly. That's who we are apart from Christ. But then we come together and we put on Christ together. And we've been made new. But man, I sure hope we're not pretending that that righteousness is ours. That we don't pretend that the righteousness that we have in Jesus, that we've clothed ourselves in now, I hope we don't pretend that that's ours. It's prideful arrogance. Can I just tell you that as we relate to one another in this church, in the church of Jesus Christ, we should relate to one another with humility rather than looking down on somebody else for maybe what they've done, what's in their past. And we come together understanding the ground is level at the foot of the cross, that we all come as sinners. And we don't just serve each other in our strengths. We also serve each other in our weaknesses. Can I just tell you this? And I believe this is true that God has worked more through my weaknesses and failures than he has my successes and my strengths. That people will connect with you more in your weakness than they will in their strength. That oftentimes people that are caught up in sin, they're isolated and alone. And a simple act of confession. Let me tell you where I've been. Let me tell you how God's working in my life. Let me tell you where I struggled this week. And it opens up the door to tell people that they're not alone. And they're not walking through the difficulties of life alone. When we talk about living in community in this koinonia and fellowship with other believers, it's not just in our strengths, but it's also in our weaknesses. We pursue one another relationally and we live authentically. We're honest about our weaknesses and our struggles and our failures. 
James chapter 5, 16. We confess our sins one to another, and we pray for each other that we might be healed. Our goal is is to follow Jesus Christ and see him bear fruit in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So we pursue others relationally. We live authentically in the midst of those relationships, admitting strengths and weaknesses, but also our failures and our flaws. Now, the third thing that we do is we counsel one another biblically. Read on down with me here. We'll begin in uh, verse 16. The Apostle Paul tells him, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, you might think, what do they do? And they like walk up to each other and be like, Jesus loves me. Like, do they really just sing songs to each other? Well, here's the thing. First century, they didn't have nice leather-bound, large letter printed copies of the New Testament. And they had the apostles teaching at this point. I mean, the church at Colossae got Paul's letter, but they didn't have like the whole document to look back to and to teach them uh, the will of God for their lives. And so oftentimes they would preserve and communicate theological truths through songs. And what was assumed is that as people went through their lives, they endured the difficulties that were to come. I mean, Jesus promised, in this life you will have trouble. And what was assumed here is that in the midst of those troubles, we would be tempted to doubt. That our faith faith might grow weak and we might start to waver. That we might be pulled away at times by the things of this world. The Apostle Paul is like, hey, let the word of God dwell within you richly. For them, they memorized these songs that taught them about the faith. And then they would speak them to one another. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to encourage one another when life hit them in the mouth and when things got difficult and when difficult circumstances clouded their view of God and his goodness. They would remind each other of who God was and of the truth of his word. Uh, When we live in community with other believers in this koinonia, this level of deep fellowship, we speak the truth of God's word. Listen, I I don't hold any of the opinions that I hold uh, for no reason. Matter of fact, I like to think about things, and I have developed the opinions that I have, and I think I'm right about most things. But the truth of it is, I'm often wrong. I'm a flawed person. My perspectives are skewed at times. The advice I would give would be off at times. And when we gather with other believers... And we speak the word to them. And we speak with all the confidence we we can have from speaking the word of God to each other. When we counsel one another biblically, we can in faith know that the advice we're giving is going to be sound and helpful. That this is true for every person in every place and at every time. The truth of God's word, it is eternal. And so when we gather with other believers house to house and we begin to fellowship and we invest our lives in each other and live authentically, We speak and remind each other of the Word of God, of who God is, of His goodness, and how He's called us to live and to walk. We counsel one another biblically. We ask over and over and over in our community groups, that's how we practice community here, what does the Word of God have to say about that? Like, you might have some good opinions, and they don't don't matter at all in comparison to the truth of God's Word. So we bring the Scriptures to bear on behalf of one another, reminding one another of the truths of Scripture. But there's one more. We pursue each other relationally. We live authentically. We counsel biblically. And the final thing that we do in community is we admonish one another faithfully. If counseling biblically is helping people understand this is the path that God wants you to walk, here's what the truth says, here's the path that you should live in, admonishing faithfully is finding someone who's veered off the path and is calling them to come back. Do you remember how Jesus talked about uh, our, our lives and the path that we walk? He said there is a really wide gate and a, a broad, smooth path. It's the path that leads to destruction. And most people walk that path. 
If you just kind of uh, let yourself go in the current of our culture and of this world, you're going to float nicely through that big wide gate. You're, you're right down the path like it's not going to be any trouble. The problem is that that path leads to destruction. He said there's also a narrow gate and a narrow path that leads to life. And few find it. When we come together with other believers living in community with one another, this koinonia, committing ourselves to one another, we're committing to helping each other walk that narrow path. We say to one another, when you see me step off the path, I need you to admonish me. I need you to remind me that I'm headed the wrong direction. Several months ago, I got a chance to go spend some time with some friends that I had not uh, got to spend time with in a very long time. And it was an amazing weekend, uh, but I got to be honest with you. One of my friends is super well off, and he has some very, very, very nice things. And when I was up there, I got to enjoy time with my buddy and I enjoyed his nice things. I'll tell you, like there was some, some really impressive stuff. And I'd come home and I was talking to one of the guys in my group, just telling about my trip. And my friend is, is so great. And it was a couple hours later, I got a text message. And he was like, hey, I'm not trying to cause any trouble, whatever. But I noticed when you were talking to me about your time you spent with your buddy and all these nice things, I noticed that there was something there. I don't know if it's love of money I don't know what's going on, but there's something there, and you need to look into it. And of course, I got the text message, and I thought, Psh, how dare him, you know? I'm the pastor. I know things. I, people don't need to tell me my business. I, I have a seminary degree. But you know what? He was right. And somewhere along the way, I, I didn't intend to do this, I began to covet things that God hasn't given to me. And rather than simply enjoying the opportunity to enjoy those things, I started wanting them for myself. And I didn't see that on my own. The problem for all of us is that we have blind spots. And the problem with blind spots is that we can't see them. When we walk in community, we pursue relationships, deep, rich, abiding relationships with other believers, we're inviting them to speak into our lives and those areas of our lives that we can't see. And what we're saying is, hey, would you help me walk that narrow path? Let's walk it together. And when you stumble and fall, and maybe you get out of line, I'm, I'm going to be there to pick you up. I'm going to love you enough to tell you the truth when you start to go off the path and you're headed for error. Today I'm inviting you to begin investing in relationships. The quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. And it's, it's borne out in Harvard-level research, and it's certainly taught to us throughout Scripture that we should invest our lives in one another. Now, the way that we do that here at this church, sometimes it happens very organically. Uh, when I was a young kid, we went to Trinity, or I'm sorry, Independence Baptist Church at Hevener. And it was a church of 40 or 50 people. And I knew the dude that had candy, uh, candy and gum every Sunday morning. I know that he's right here behind me. I knew where the lady sat that sang off key. I mean, you knew everything about everybody because it was a little bitty church and community happened very naturally. I think last Sunday, our church was almost 700 people scattered across two campuses and several different services. I want you to know that community doesn't happen naturally in, in crowds of this size. It's something that we have to be intentional about. The way that we've organized here, it's not the perfect way. It's not even necessarily the best way. The way that we've chosen to organize ourselves here is into community groups. And so today, what I want to encourage you to do, as you think about sowing seeds into your life, investing in God's kingdom, that you would invest in deep, meaningful, abiding relationships with other believers in this church, and we ask you to do it through a community group, that you would commit to walking alongside a group of people, for better or for worse, through the ups and through the downs, that you would be there for them when they're struggling, and they might do the same for you. That you would pursue them relationally. Live authentically with them. You would counsel them biblically, admonish them faithfully, that you could enjoy the good things together, raise your children together, invest in marriages together. Like it's living life deeply with other people, locking arms with them, and pursuing Jesus Christ. Here coming up, and really it's just a week, on February the 5th, 
We're going to be gathering at the Reynolds Center. If you're here, and whether you're a member or not a member, if you're a part of this church and you're not in a community group, uh, we want to invite you to come. That's where we're going to try to gather people together. Uh, if you show up to this event and, you know, it just really doesn't click with the people who are going to be there, we're not saying you're locked into community for a decade with, with these people. But this is the event where we're going to gather people together and hopefully introduce you to people that you can live out the next 10 years of your life with. Now, if you're already in a community group, you're a member, we want to invite you to this meeting to sharpen what it looks like for you guys to walk in community together. And so we invite every single person in this room next Sunday night, that's February the 5th. It may not be next Sunday night. I'm bad with dates, but you know what I'm talking about. February 5th, uh, we'll be at the Reynolds Center. You can sign up online. You can go to the Welcome Center. We'll get you connected with that. Um, But what we're doing is we're investing in our relationships. We're scattering seeds. We're asking God to produce a harvest in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We're seeking to no longer live as we've been taught to live in this world. You know, a lone ranger, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, and instead we're choosing to live lives together with others, and we're asking God to bear fruit in us through this practice. Would you bow with me? Father, we again thank you for your word and how you have taught us how to live. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who takes off the old ways of living, the old patterns of relating to one another, and God, that we would invest our lives into one another, that we could have richness and depth of relationships, certainly, God, that that increases our joy and our our happiness and the, the richness of our life. But God, may you also use us to do that for others. Lord, you've told us in your word that the world will recognize us by the love that we have one for another. God, may we be a church that has compassion for one another and exhibits kindness, shows patience, bears with one another, forgives one another, loves one another. And God, every time when we think, how should I relate to other people, may we look back to you and see how you have ultimately related to us. We're reminded of your death on the cross for our sins the body that you offered up, the blood that you shed for us. God, we just pray that you might empower us to live like that, to love other people like that. Thankful for these men and women. God, we pray that you would just work in our hearts and through our hearts, bear much fruit in every single man and woman in this place. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.